I have a question for you. Who likes to eat dinner? Who likes to eat corn on the cob? Okay, so let's imagine for a moment that it's a beautiful spring day like today, and it's dinner time, and your family has just sat down for dinner, and because it's such a nice day, your dad leaves the door that's close to the table open so all the fresh air can come in. You pick up your corn on the cob, and before you take a bite, you look at that doorway, and there is something standing in the doorway. That. What would you think? I think don't move. Um, I think it's either a badger or a skunk. Don't breathe or move. Run. Yeah, so maybe some other things might be, you're not welcome here. Maybe it's a skunk, and I know all about your kind. You're going to ruin our dinner. Go away. I just sat down for dinner, and I don't have time to deal with you. You're not my friend. Well, this is exactly what happened to the Hoyt family. And as they sat at the table, Mr. Hoyt had an idea. He took his salad bowl, and he poured his salad out onto his dinner plate, and he set his bowl on the table and picked up the pitcher of milk, and he filled up the bowl with milk, and he carefully set the bowl down on the floor, and he used his foot to scoot the bowl as close to the skunk as he could. And they watched, and the skunk stood there, and he smelled, his little nose was moving, and he looked around, and then he accepted the invitation. He drank the bowl of milk. And when he was finished, he went out the door and took off. Wow, they thought this was the coolest experience. Well, a couple days went by, and it was dinner time. They sat down for their meal, and they heard something at the door. The skunk was back. So they quickly set down a bowl of milk and opened up the door, and he came in and enjoyed a bowl of milk. And then he went right back out the door and left. Well, a couple days later, it happened again. This time, they thought, we better name this skunk. They named him Mr. Corporal. And Mr. Corporal continued to come back for dinner regularly, almost every night. Well, one night, they sat down for their meal, and the bowl, was sitting on, bowl of milk was sitting on the floor. And Mr. Corporal didn't come. And the next night, he didn't come. And another night, he didn't come. And they thought, well, what happened to him? And they were a little concerned, but most of all, they missed him. And a couple weeks went by. They sat down for their meal, and they heard something at the door. They heard some, sounded like feet patting the ground. And Mr. Hoyt went to the door to look, and he didn't see anything. He sat back down, and they thought, well, it must be our imagination. So they began eating, and not too long after, they heard something again. Mr. Hoyt got up to look, and this time, it was Mr. Corporal. So they opened the door and put down the bowl of milk, and um, he, Mr. Hoyt sat back down, and he, Mr. Corporal just stood there. Normally, he would jump in the door and have his bowl of milk. Well, he just stood there this time for what seemed like the longest time. Well, eventually, he came in, and he started drinking his milk. And guess who followed him in? Mrs. Corporal and three babies. And they were a little more reluctant to come in the house, but they did. And they all enjoyed the bowl of milk and then they left. And, you know, this became a regular event. The story didn't say how long it lasted, but it lasted for some time after that. And it got me thinking that sometimes we can look at a person's outward appearance and think the same things about that person that we thought of the skunk when he first arrived. 
Do you remember what we thought of the skunk? What were those things? Get out of here, just as Andrew said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we thought, you're not welcome here. It's a skunk, I know all about your kind. You're gonna ruin our dinner, go away. I don't have time for you. All of those things. Sometimes we can judge a person this way when all that person needs is a chance. Just like Mr. Hoyt gave Mr. Corporal a chance. A chance made something beautiful happen. A friendship and a trusting relationship. The Hoyt family knew they could trust Mr. Corporal not to stink things up, and Mr. Corporal knew he could trust the Hoyt family not to hurt him, and in fact, he felt so comfortable that he invited others to come with him, right? Yeah, so the next time that you, or you, or me, or any of us are tempted to judge someone by how they look, let's try instead to just give them a chance. I have a couple uh, scripture readings. Let's see what the Bible says. Would someone like to read one? Do not judge other people. Then you will not be judged. You will be judged in the same way you judge others. You will be measured in the same way you measure others. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Um, stop judging only by what you see. Judge in the right way, John seven twenty four. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for creating us. Thank you for making us all different in how we look and how we talk and our personalities. Please help us, Lord, not to judge people by the way they look. But instead, help us to remember, Lord, that there is no one that we can look at today who you don't already love. Thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for all of these little ones, and we pray, Lord, that their relationship with, with you will grow closer each and every day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be on John 17, 14, 6 to 10. I have shown you to the disciples you have gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them, and they knew for certain that, that I came from you. They believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. I am praying for those who have given me because they are yours. Jesus' prayer for his disciples, John 17. When we were at the food bank not long ago, um, Ken was talking about how important that chapter was to him, and we had a little conversation. It's such an important chapter to know that Jesus was praying for his disciples, and that's what Charlie read. But if you want to turn to John 17, a little farther down, the heading in my Bible says, Jesus prays for all believers. Let's look at John 17, 20. It says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's the prayer for us. Do you think Jesus' prayer is heard in heaven? Do you think all power is being manifested so that that will come true? Then the question is, is it coming true in your life? 
And I will, I'll let you think of a follow-up question for that. But today, we will hear from a couple of our own members for whom Christ prayed, who are going to share how his prayer has come true in their lives. And first of all, we have one of our newest members, Ken Maddox. He's been with us. It doesn't seem new anymore. So please come up, Ken, and share it with us. Okay. Thank you. Does this thing work? I guess it does. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Kathy's already introduced me, and let me say it was a little over a year ago, uh, just before COVID closed down the church, I started coming to this church. I'm not a, I wasn't a Christian at that time. Um, I felt compelled to come, but I really didn't follow the Lord's ways. I was a person of the world, and I thought I was a good guy. I lived within the laws of the land. I was very legalistic, but I was not a Christian. So um, maybe I should give you a little history about myself, and that'll take us back a little ways. And before I do that, though, I want to say that my life's been a journey, just like everybody else's. And I think for years, a lot of years, I was on the wrong path. And it's just been within the last year I've found the right path, and now I'm continuing my journey. There's a lot I don't know, but I'm eager to learn. And over time, I've learned that I do love the Lord. I couldn't have said that a year ago. My, my background actually uh, started with uh, my mother. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. She converted with her mother back in 1934. So that puts a date out there that's back there. And when she married my father and had children, my father was not a Christian. But, and she did not attend church. So we weren't active in the church. But my mother taught us how to pray. We said the blessing. We said bedtime prayers. And she also read us bedtime stories. They were Bible stories from Uncle Arthur's Bible stories. I love those stories. And I believed him, and that was really the foundation of my Christianity belief, because those Bible stories translated to me what the Bible was. And as time went on, that's all I knew of the Bible was those Bible stories. And so I learned about uh, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, uh, Noah's Ark, creation, Adam and Eve, all those things I learned through those stories. Also, my mother set it up so we could go to church. And we went to a Seventh-day Adventist church, and I can remember Mrs. Eisman picking us up and taking myself and my two brothers to church. And that would have been back in 1956, 57, 58, and 59. And when Mrs. Eisman couldn't do it, Mrs. Abbott picked us up. And I learned about the Seventh-day Adventist Church then. And for all practical purposes, that was my church. And I was just a child then, but all through my life, when anybody asked me what religion I was, I always referred to, I said I was raised Seventh-day Adventist, even though I wasn't. As time went on, and I was in the public school system, my father was not a Christian, uh, we just, and I just moved away from the church, from religion, and 
I became a person of the world. And then in 1966, I graduated from high school. And it's funny how some dates you never forget, but October 19th, 1966, I went into the military. And in 1966, that was the Vietnam War. That was the height of it. And I went in as a Navy corpsman, hospital corpsman. For those of you who don't know what a hospital corpsman is, that's the equivalent of an Army medic. And as a corpsman, it was my job to render or medical aid to those people who were injured. Hospital corpsmen serve in Navy hospitals, on Navy ships, and also Marine Corps and the Seabees. I was never on a ship and really wasn't in a hospital, so I spent my time with the, attached to the Marine Corps and the uh, Seabees. I spent two tours in Vietnam went over there twice, and I don't want to really talk about it, but uh, Vietnam left marks, scars, and I did not understand how the Lord could allow a war like that to go on. After I got discharged in 19, or July 1970, I uh, went to work. I married while I was in the military. And not by design, but I became a policeman. And my marriage was not doing well. It was struggling. I prayed that the Lord would hold it together. And it didn't. It ended in divorce. And I blamed the Lord for not helping me. I didn't understand why he didn't help me. I went back to school, got a degree in business administration, uh, emphasis in personnel, and I went to work for a corporation in that area, human resources, personnel, I moved five times with that company in 25 years. And my last move, I became the Director of Human Resources, Labor Relations and Employment here in Boise for the J.R. Simplot Company. And I was over the HR function, and I had control over the United States and Canada. I retired early. And I say that I had a, a good career. I enjoyed my, my job. But when I retired, I was ready to re retire and do something else. So I started the business. And I've been in that business for over 20 years. It's been successful up till March of 2020. And uh, with COVID and a six week shutdown, uh, it was a, uh, it was a disaster, and the business has been struggling ever since. In November of 2019, I had stepped out of the operations and the general manager's position, and my son had taken over. So I had kind of stepped back and I had kind of retired. Not completely, I still did the financials, but I had a lot of free time. Going back a little bit, in October of 2019, I had a business trip. It was one of those fast trips where you want to go over one day and come back the same day. And I'm a private pilot, and I have my own aircraft, so I flew from here to Seattle, Washington, in the beautiful blue sky, all the way to Yakima. And then we hit a cloud bank. And of course, I knew that was going to happen, so I took along a pilot with a IFR rating, instrument flight rating. 
because we had to land in Seattle and that cloud bank stretched from, from Yakima over to the coast, covered most of Washington and Oregon. So to land there, I needed somebody who, could, who was certified to fly the plane in the clouds. So when we got near the Seattle area, uh, he took over, flew down through the clouds, we landed, I conducted the business, two hours I was done, and we started our turnaround flight, headed back. Where we are in Seattle airspace, so you're under the direction of a controller, they tell you where to fly, and uh, they give you headings. Instead of heading us straight west and out of the fog, or the, out of the clouds, they headed us northwest, kept our altitude between five and 8,000 feet. That put us right in the fog continuously and kept us there longer. And as we flew, I noticed I started forming on the windscreen. It's the windshield, it would be the windshield on the car. It's right in front of you. And the ice just came down to where you couldn't see out the front windscreen. In that particular situation, it wasn't a big deal because we were flying IFR by instruments and we're in the fog anyway and you couldn't see beyond the wings. But also I noticed ice forming on the wings. And as time goes on, the ice forms more and more. Every pilot knows how critical icing is on an airplane. It's a dangerous situation. And if it's allowed to accumulate, it can cause the airplane to come down. It's, especially in a light aircraft, it's the weight or the balance or even changes the aerodynamics. And as we was flying there, I wasn't doing anything but sitting, and so I was sitting, trying to be very calm. But inside I was stressed, I was nervous, I was anxious. Um, wondering what was going to happen. I knew if we were in this too long, I knew what would happen. But, the controller turned us west and told us we could fly as high as we wanted to. The only problem was the airplane wasn't performing as well as it should. It was flying slower and it wasn't climbing as well as it should. And we were at 8,000 feet then and we had another couple thousand feet to climb. And as I sat there silently, and we'd been silent in the cabin, me and this other pilot, we had not talked to each other probably for 10 minutes. Of course, he was busy flying the plane, and he was a man of few words, but he said this, this is bad. We might not make it. And that wasn't a shock to me, but it drove home the point with what I was thinking, it was valid. So I turned and looked out the window, and it looked like to me there was even more ice on the, on the wing. And I didn't, uh, I just a split second, I just decided to say a prayer. My mother had told me for the last four or five years, and I take care of her, and some of you know my mother, Mary Sterner. She's a member of this church. She told me that prayer worked. I hadn't prayed in a long time. As a matter of fact, I couldn't remember when the last time was I prayed, but it had been years. So I started the prayer, and I said, Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, this was my training kicking in. This is a child is what I learned to pray like this. But then I thought, what am I going to say? And then I just said, Lord, please save us. And then I couldn't think of anything else to say, and I said, Amen. And then I just kind of glazed over. I didn't really see anything. I wasn't really thinking anything. I was just there. And I was in that nervous state. And then I turned and looked back into the cabin. I looked at the front of the airplane, looked at the gauges, but really not seeing. And I was sitting there. And I was sitting there. I became aware of, you know, I feel calm. I feel peaceful. And then I said, 
And I said this to myself, it was in my head, I said, I feel okay. I think everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right now. Now, I really don't know what I meant by that, but it was a feeling. And it was so much better than the other feeling. I was actually enjoying it. While I'm sitting there thinking about this, sunlight shot through the cabin of the airplane. It was everywhere. I remember looking up and there was the ice covered windscreen. I looked out the window and I could see blue sky. This was off to my left. And then I looked over to the right and the same thing. And off in the distance was clouds probably a mile or two away, kind of a cloud bank. I thought I could see the top of the clouds. I looked below me and there was nothing but clouds below us, but the blue sky above us. So we'd kind of flown into a concaved area, and the airplane was flying in that, and as long as the sun was shining on us, it would stop the ice situation. We flew in that area for about four or five minutes. The plane started flying better, and we did top out over the clouds, so we flew on home. And as we flew on home, the, the other guy said, you got the control, so I took over and flew home. But I was thinking, what had happened? What had just happened? And I kept saying, well, this was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. What a chain of events. The controller gave us a heading, flew us to this spot. This spot was unnatural, yet it was there. And it was just in the nick of time, because I don't know how much time we had. Whether it was two or three minutes, five minutes, or seconds. I really didn't know. But I thought, I was the luckiest person ever. Pushed the airplane, we landed in Nampa and pushed the airplane in the hangar and I drove home. And while I was driving home, I started thinking about it. And as I was thinking about it, I kind of forgot where I was at. I was just driving and thinking about it. And I didn't realize where I was driving until I hit my neighborhood, and then I realized that I just had kind of spaced out. <laughs> I'd covered all that distance and didn't really, I really wasn't aware of it. And then I said to myself, as I got in front of my house, enough of this. The Lord saved me. I said a prayer and everything changed. And it was hard for me to believe, but I come to the conclusion. And I did thank the Lord. And I thought, you know, I ought to go to church. I need to go to church. Now, this was in October. I drive by this church every day, at least once, sometimes two or three times, but I could not plan or figure out how to come to church. I just couldn't do it. I didn't do it. And when I drive by, I'd say, you know, I ought to go to church, but I didn't do it. Now, I see my mother every day, and... I read the Bible to her every night. She can't read anymore because she can't see. This was in February. And I was reading the Bible to her. I seem to have missed, oh, here they are. I can't do this without glasses, so. Anyway, I was reading in Luke 13. And as I read this, this made a difference. And so Luke 13, and I'm 6, 7, 8, and 9, and I'm reading for the New International. And let me read that to you. Jesus is speaking. Then he told a parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it and did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. 
cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So when I read that and I finished, I had two questions in my mind. I knew the clock was ticking. I wondered how much time I had. And secondly, what kind of fruit would I bear? So the next Sabbath, I was here in church. And while I was here in church, I filled out a green yes card. And I said I wanted to study. As a matter of fact, I filled out two of those before the church was shut down. And then I said to myself, you know, I finally want to go to church, and I get there, and the church closes. And then guess what happened? The pastor called me and says, do you want to study? And I said, yes, I do. That was Pastor Michael. And we started to study. And so when he showed up, the first thing I said, prove to me the Bible is true. And he did that the first, first time we sat down together. Ever since then, I've believed that the Bible is true. And it is the word of God. I, uh, I think the, I found the Bible as a, as a, years ago, it was a difficult book to read. And I didn't understand it. And I found it frustrating. But with the pastor and some direction and some work, and we've studied for a year off and on, worked together. And he's been a, a great inspiration for me because I've learned a lot. I've learned that the Bible's a great book. It's the best book written. I love it. How it's all tied together from the beginning to the end. And it's the same message over and over and over. And you can pick up almost any book and you're going to get the message of how God loves you. And I remember studying that how God loves us beginning with creation and then with the Israelites and then with Jesus. It was said over and over and over. And I kept thinking how God loves all these people. And then finally it hit me. God loves me too. It took me a while to understand that. It was like I was having a history lesson and I was just learning about the history events. But I had to put myself in the picture and really understand, yes, God does love me. Now, I studied with another group of people, and that's a story in itself. I had a childhood friend that I knew for a couple of years who moved away, and I hadn't seen him for 62 years. My mother told me that one of her friends told her that he was a Seventh-day Adventist, so I called him, made contact with him, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, I'm studying, but I'd like to study more. There's a lot I don't know. And he said, give me five minutes. And then he called me back and said, yeah, me and my pastor would like to sit down with you too. So I've been studying with these guys for over a year. Started last April, 2020. We meet once a week. First, it was myself, my friend, and his pastor. And for six months, we studied together. And then after that, we expanded it and invited other people in the group. Now there's seven of us. We're the old bunch, I guess. The youngest one is 64. We run up to 80. The fellowship is so important to me. We meet. We always have a 
part of the Bible that we're going to read or we've studied. We talk about it. Uh, we talk about what's going on in our lives. We always end it in a prayer. Fellowship is so important. I, uh, the other thing that I learned about the Bible that I didn't know, absolutely did not know this, was grace. And when I heard about grace, I thought, this is too good to be true. Is it for real? And I had to have it explained to me two or three times before I comprehended that it was a true thing. The fact that you repent, you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. He died on the cross for you, for your sins. And all you have to do is love him back. It's such a great concept. Only the Lord could think of it. The thing that I struggled with as we're going through this process, and remember, I'm on a journey, and I started off with baby steps. I assumed I knew a lot, but I knew nothing. And as time went on, first I started to appreciate the Lord, what he had done, and what, what he was doing for me. And the fact that he loved me was wonderful. The fact that I could receive grace was wonderful. But my question was, do I love the Lord? How do you know you love the Lord? And I struggled with this. And it might sound funny to you, but I was asking myself that question. I came to four of the 10 prayer meetings we had last spring. I couldn't make all of them, but I did come to four of them. And I enjoyed each and every one of them. In one of those meetings, the, the speaker who was speaking, was, and it was a small group, and he was speaking to everybody, but everything he said was so applicable to me, I could understand everything that he was saying. It made perfect sense to me. And as I'm sitting there, my heart starts to swell. I feel like I'm overflowing. And the thing I'd been wrestling with just came to light. And I had to say, I love the Lord. And because of that event and of that fellowship, I know I love the Lord. So, I'm about out of time. Is that what you're telling me, Kathy? Okay, there's, let me just say, there's a couple things I want. And, uh, and I got some answers this morning, but I want to tell you, I want to be baptized. And the pastor told me to pick a date. I want to join this church formally. And I've had some great friends here that I've met. I know we're all church family, we're brothers and sisters, but those people I've met, the fact that they've been my friends, they don't know that how much their comments and their thoughts, how much I've appreciated it. So, thank you for the fellowship, all of you who are my friends. I would like to get to know everybody here in this church, because I don't know you. You are my brothers and sisters. And the last thing I want to do is do God's work. Not because I need to earn anything, but because I love the Lord, and I want to serve him, and I want to please him. So this is my story, and I want to thank you for listening. God bless
all of you. And may the Lord be with you. Thank you. And he is serving the Lord. He's a faithful member of the van ministry. And now when we have potlucks again, we'll be able to sit around tables again and get to know each other better. Isn't that true? And I, I do believe that um, some of the stories that he heard at the prayer, 10 days of prayer that really touched his heart, came from the McGuire direction. And Sherry is going to share with us some stories of what God has done in her life. We have stories from the very beginning, like when Jesus went by and said to Matthew, hey, follow me. And Jesus went through the sky and the clouds and said to Ken, hey, I'm going to save you. Follow me. And now Sherry's going to tell us a little more about what it's like following him. Happy Sabbath. So I am so far out of my comfort zone, you just can't even believe it. But anyway, um, I was trying to figure out what it was that I was going to share. And I told a story to Pastor not recently, and I thought, well, I'll just share that, I'll share that story. And I think if I go really, really fast, I'll be able to make it. So um, about 12 years ago, Mel and I decided that we were going to move to Idaho, that we felt that God was calling us actually here. And so... Um, but the re it was a recession, and it was a really hard time selling houses, and what were we going to do? And Mel felt that he needed to be there. Chuck's here this morning, and Chuck called him and said, I need you by this date. I need you by this date. I need you by this date. And so Mel decided that he was going to go, and by some very dear friends of ours, offered their guest room, and Mel stayed. Well, I stayed at home, and I... I was going to sell, pack up the house. I was going to do, um, sell it and get, get finish my job and get all that done by myself. And Mel and I had never really been apart. And um, he called me every night and said, okay, it's time for worship and we'll have prayer together. And that was amazing. Um, prayer on the phone works if you're not there in person. Anyway. So I prayed, my personal prayer was, is that our house selling would be a witness and that there would be nothing wrong with the house, that we would sell it and there wouldn't be any issues that a new buyer would buy and have. And I said that prayer because down deep, I really didn't think there was anything wrong with the house. I, I thought, oh, it's, it's fine, it'll be, it'll be good. And... And then things started happening, like finding leaks in the wall. We had remodeled, and we had redone pretty much the whole house. And we found a, a leak in the, in the master, in the, master, um, in the, in the ba main bathroom, which we'd had completely remodeled. And we found a, a leak, an actual broken pipe in the master bathroom that was so bad that you had to take the shower out and, and fix it. I couldn't reach it from the crawl space. We found out that maybe the roof might leak. So what we needed to do with the roof is that we needed to put in, have a cricket put in so that it wouldn't possibly ever leak. So it was like, okay. And then they found mold in the master, ba in the master bathroom, in the closet, in the, in the, above the closet, in the attic. And I'm like, mold? Oh no, mold. That's like burn the house down mold and there and it was like we had expert hazmat people come in and they go no it isn't the kind of mold that you have to actually burn the house down we'll be able to fix it so it was like they 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 fixed the mold and the master and then they said well you know what we're having issues with radon in this area there's probably there might be radon on your house so i'm like radon what in the world is radon and they said okay so they had somebody come in and they said, yes, your house po tested positive for radon. And I'm like, okay, we didn't burn it down for the mold. Do we have to burn it down for the radon? And they're like, no, we don't have to do that. What we will do is we'll come in and we'll put down this pristine white blanket of white across every bit of dirt underneath your, in your crawl space. 
So underneath our house was cleaner at that point than our whole house was. And it was just amazingly, just, just absolutely amazing white underneath a, a house. I mean, just crazy. And that was supposed to block the poison from coming in. And then I, we got all those things taken care of. And it was like, OK. <sighs> so I come up with this brilliant idea that I am going to clean out the freezer. And I am going to put the broccoli and the green beans that are in a big frozen bag that have been in there way too long. I'm going to put those down the garbage disposal. So I kind of thaw them in the, fr in the sink. And I, 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 they're this big puddle of mush, and I start putting them down the garbage disposal. Well, I get pretty much all the broccoli and all the green beans down the garbage disposal, and guess what? I plugged up the system. And I'm like, now what? Now what am I going to do? I, we're going to have an inspector come. I can't, I, the sink doesn't work. What am I going to do? And then it was like, well, Mel, call Mel. Mel, what do I do? We've got all these other things, but now the plumbing is broken. What am, what am I going to do? Call Dad. So I called my father-in-law, and I said, can, I've got a major problem. Can you come help me? And he says, yes, I can. So he comes, and he has a snake, and he puts the snake down. And he goes, hmm, that didn't work. And he says, well, what we could do is get a longer one. I says, I can go to Home Depot. I can be there because it's late. I can be there first thing in the morning. I can be there with the contractors. So I go to, um, I get a 50-foot snake. I bring that back next day. My, my father-in-law comes, tries putting that down. Doesn't work. It's like, oh, what are we going to do? He says, well, it's an, all's not lost. I've got a really good idea. What will happen is I'll put a hose from the faucet. I'll bring it up through the window because you'll be on the outside. We'll put the hose through the window. We'll put it down the sink, and we'll put it down through the pipes, and it'll flush the pipe out, and there's some kind of a plug. I might have to talk really fast. So anyway, louder? OK. OK. So am I too close, or is this fine? Anyway, so, I, so anyway, we, put, we end up putting that down. And he was like, oh, that was not a good idea. My father-in-law's on one side. I can't see what he's doing. He's, I'm on the other side, and I, he can't see what I'm doing, but I, he's going to tell me to turn the faucet on. So I'm there, and I go, OK, I can turn the faucet on. And then I'm like, I don't really want to turn the faucet on. Not in my, I'm going to flood my kitchen. I really don't want to turn the faucet on. And he's like, turn the faucet on when I tell you to. So I said, OK. So it's dark. And I'm down on our patio, turn the faucet on. And he's yelling, it's working, it's working. And I'm sitting there going, oh, maybe it is working. And I'm, and I'm there, and I've got the faucet all the way up. Pretty soon, I'm like, there's stuff falling on me. What in the world is falling on me? Broccoli and green beans is raining on me. And I'm like, I'm shutting the water off. And he goes, no, 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 it's working. And then water starts coming down. I'm going, no, this is not working. And I shut the faucet off. What'd you shut it off for? Well, it wasn't working. It's raining broccoli and grass. So it's coming up through, it's coming up through the vent and shooting broccoli and green beans all over my patio, that, my walls, I mean, me, roof. So anyway, so we get that all taken care of. And um, go, that didn't work. We still have the problem. We still have the plug. And Mel says, don't worry about it. I'm on my way. I'll be there in just a little while, and we'll figure it out. Well, so Mel, Mel goes, and he starts at the other end, and he finds the plug. And he goes, it's right not that far from the sink. And this is just a piece of pipe that's old and crusty that we haven't replaced. You can take the two things loose. We can drop it, and we will have then we'll have a, a, a new pipe. You can go to Home Depot again and get a new pipe. So we went to, I went to do Home Depot. He replaces the pipe, drops it on this pristine, beautiful, white carpet under our house. It's completely full sludge and gross, just awfulness. And 
And so, anyway, um, I decide then that I'm going to go. We get everything taken care of. We have new plumbing. We have everything. Everything's great. Everything's good. I've got the house all clean. Got things packed up. I call my daughter and I say, I'm going to go spend the day with my, with my, um, with my daughter. I mean, with my my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, because I don't know when I will see them again. And um, I will. I'll spend some time with them, and I will. Um, so I won't be home. So I go out there, and as I go home, and I don't know, I don't know how to turn this. This, when I get back, this is what greets me. This is my patio in my backyard. There's a tree that's fallen. And what, I was like, are you kidding me? But the amazing thing about this tree, if you look at it, God took out the center of the tree and he dropped it. dropped it so just the right amount hit the house just enough to scrape the door bend the bend the gutter a little bit but that's all the house wasn't crushed and it, just so you can get an idea of how big of a tree that is that's my brother he's six feet and that's the cut up so anyway so I go now what do I do I call my brother He's a logger of sorts, and he says, I'll come down, uh, I have just a free time, and I will come down, and I will, and I will help you. So he goes, I just happen to have the, the time to do it. So he comes down with all his chainsaws, he, he, and I start, as soon as he's, saw, he's, he's sawing, and I'm taking bits and pieces of this to the back, so it's a big brush pile. And it was like, it started hosing down rain. And hosing. And so there's this big brush pile now in the back of our yard. We've got all of the wood that somebody's going to come and pick up for their fireplace. And here we are, here I am, with this big brush pile that's sopping. I mean, you couldn't believe how wet it was. It was like, choose you this day whom you will serve. I'm pouring water on the top of this brush pile. And my brother gets a propane torch, he gets gasoline, and he's trying to burn up the brush pile. But it doesn't burn. It doesn't burn. He can't even get the pitch to burn. And I'm, I'm like, OK. This, this is not working. We have to pray. So my brother and I out there in the rain both say a prayer. And we ask, Lord, the brush pile has to go away. It cannot be here. And we need to, um, we need to, we need to get rid of it. It needs to go. But we, it doesn't burn. So then my brother starts it again. It burns. He burns this brush pile. I mean, massive brush pile. He burns it. It's, it burns so flowers. You couldn't even tell that there was a brush pile ever there. I mean, there wasn't even ashes. It was just flat. And I'm like, so amazing. But then I'm thinking, okay, what is the story with this? This is later. This is within the last couple of years. What is the story with this? Because I believe that God has a purpose in every single thing that happens to us. Everything, everything. He has a reason of things that he's trying to teach us. And I'm like, what were you trying to teach me with that mess? And he says, Sherry, you are the house. You didn't think there really was anything wrong with you. But really, you have leaks in the walls. You have mold in the attic. You have, you have a big, huge block of sludge that is not allowing the water of life to flow through you. And what you need to do is you need to drop it on that rope of righteousness. You need to drop that on me. You need to, you need to let me have it and have it go away. And no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter what it is, I will not allow anything to crush you. That tree will not fall on you. 
And in the end, if you choose me, if you do, you, if you just take a hold of my hand, that in the end, all that brush is going to be burnt up. It's going to be gone. You will not be able to tell that it was ever there. But I will, I will carry the scars, which we never cleaned up, the scars from the, from the door. It was like, no, this is battle scars. These are battle scars. The scratch on the door, this, this bent gutter, it's a battle scar. And Jesus is going to carry the battle scars for out eternity. But ours are going to be gone. Ours are going to be washed. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing. Anyway, um, that's kind of my story. Uh, I'd like to have a prayer. Can we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love that even though you show us the things that are in our in our lives that you want to take them, as Ken said, grace, that is who you are. You're a God of grace. That you take us and you and you mold us into your into your um, children. And that no matter what it is, what's in our lives. We got big blockages of sludge. You clean it. You take us and you make us into creatures that are are new. And one day, Heavenly Father, we want to throw our crowns at your feet. And we want to thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you for the Sabbath that you've given us that we can rest in you. Each week be renewed. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. What a wonderful story, the song that the children chose ahead of time to end this wonderful time of sharing, anywhere with Jesus, in our hearts or in our bodies, up in the sky, in the clouds, or in our backyard. Jesus is always there with us. Thank you, Father, for always being with us, whether you are calling us for the first time for our response or whether you are calling us to let you clear the sludge from our hearts. Wherever we are in the path, please cover us with your grace through this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen.